particle fixing software using positive unlabeled learning. So just as a brief overview of what I'll what I'll be talking about in this webinar, first I'll just tell you guys about an introduction to particle picking, why particle picking is challenging, mostly due to incomplete labeling, and then positive unlabeled learning. And we'll look at a comparison of methods for positive unlabeled learning and, and an additional autoencoder-based regularization that we can apply to models. Then I'll introduce the our whole particle picking framework using positive unlabeled learning, that's Topaz. Look at Topaz applied to several data sets, and then I'll give you a sneak peek of some future Topaz updates. And I have to give a uh, big thanks to Alex Noble at New York Structural Biology Center. He's uh, been my main collaborator on this project, and he's done a lot of, helped a lot, and especially like looking at the applications and also in some of the upcoming Topaz updates. So, just quickly, what are the highlights of Topaz? Topaz is able to pick more real particles with less hand labeling. Um, it's good for picking a representative set of particles, more representative sets of particles than conventional methods. Uh, it can pick particles of any shape and size. We also are able to reduce bias due to iterative filtering of particles that is what people will typically do. There's no need to fully label micrographs unlike in some of the other convolutional neural net frameworks. And we also have a normalization in Topaz. I'm not gonna talk about it today, but if you're interested, you can, you can look at the paper that makes grid masking a thing of the past. And if you want to download Topaz, you can go to our GitHub, it's a link there. Okay, so what is particle picking? In the general cryo-EM uh, structure determination pipeline, what we're interested in doing in, in single particle cryo-EM is to basically uh, collect, it, have a sample of our protein and we're going to freeze it on a grid and image it in the electron microscope. And what we get are these huge field images containing many instances of our particle. So here, for example, Many instances of our particles spread throughout these images, and our particles are um, often very low signal to noise, and we have a lots of structured kind of uh, background artifacts like this ice chunk here. And to actually do 3D reconstruction to actually get a structure, this isn't the structure for this data set, but it's just an example, is we need to collect many, many, many examples of these projections of our proteins so that we can use uh, back projection type algorithms to determine what the structure was. And so what that involves is having to go through all of these large images, all these micrographs, and actually pick out all of our particles. And so this problem is called particle picking. And because of the number of particles that we need to observe, th this is, can be uh, quite a time, time sink. And in the past, when people used to do this by hand, right, you would have to go through these micrographs and label thousands tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of particles. And so here in this micrograph, just to illustrate why for especially data sets that proteins that people are increasingly interested in using cryonium for, this can be very hard, is so here in blue, what I've circled are some particles on this micrograph, and you can see they're very difficult to see. They, they look something like this. They're very difficult to see. There's something one here, there's one here maybe, there's one here. And you can see this. these were actually labeled by uh, by the person who, who collected this data, and, and they even missed many examples of their particle. Okay, so how can we sort of formalize this problem? Formally, what we have is this micrograph, this large image, and what we want is to get the coordinates of all of our particles, so all of our objects in this image. And so one way we can approach this is basically to just say, like, let's say I have a function that can score a micrograph region. So we're gonna score windows of this micrograph as whether they contain a particle or do not contain a particle. We can then apply that function to every window to get a score per pixel. And then we can use some sort of heuristic like non-maximum suppression to just say, okay, given this, given this um, per pixel scores, we'll just extract the coordinates by taking our highest scoring things and then removing all candidates around it. So, and as our coordinates. And this works well, but the problem is that we have to 
have this function. We have to have something that can score a micrograph region as being a particle or not a particle. So what should this function be? It should be a convolutional neural network. And that's pretty much the direction everyone is going now. And for good reason, because these models are very flexible, they're very powerful. Um, we can use them to classify images very effectively. However, the problem is that in the conventional setting, we need to have many examples of positives and many examples of negatives. And here I've just printed the, the typical empirical risk uh, minimization formula that we would use to find the parameters of this model. I'm not going to really go into detail about this, but we're gonna focus more on just how do we actually train these models rather than what these models look like. So, okay, we need large amounts of labeled data to train a convolutional neural network. And in the context of particle picking, what that means is that a person needs to label many positives, but also many negatives. In fact, uh, for, for these kinds of data sets, you have to label a lot more negatives than you label positives because most regions aren't positive. There's a lot of diversity in negatives. You have to label a representative set. I believe in, um, in Steve Ludke's paper on tomogram segmentation with convolutional neural nets, they recommend something like 10, labeling 10 times as many negatives as positives. So that, that can be a big time sink if you have to label a lot of them. And it's also actually difficult to label a representative set. So can we, so the question is, can we, can we fit our parameters of our classifier in a better way, right? It's, it's, it's easy for a person to label a small amount of positives but it's not so easy for them to label all positives and it's not so easy for them to label a lot of positives and a lot of negatives. So is there some way that we can actually train our classifier where we use a small amount of positive data and actually leverage the fact that we have all this other unlabeled data? And the answer is yes, we can do that. This is positive unlabeled classification and it's a specific type of semi-supervised learning. And there's been some research into this in, in general in the machine learning community, sort of general approaches to PU learning, um, most notably is this non-negative risk estimator, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But the idea is basically that we want to learn the parameters of our classifier, where we have positively labeled data and the rest of our data is unlabeled. That means unlabeled data is composed of both positives and negatives, but we don't know which is which. And we want some sort of loss function that we're going to use an optimizer to find the parameters that minimizes this, this function. Okay, the only assumption that we do need to make for all of these methods is that we know the positive class prior. And the positive class prior is simply the fraction of data that is positive in the unlabeled data. And uh, I won't really get into how you can choose this, but in general, it's not hard to estimate by eye. And most of these methods, actually, all of these methods aren't very sensitive to it anyway. So it's, it's not a particular burden to have to know this, um, but it is a little bit annoying. So in the positive unlabeled learning framework in general, what we have is in, in this cartoon, the, the problem with positive unlabeled learning is we have something like here are positives, these pluses, here are negative data points, these minuses, and we only have a small amount of the positives that are labeled here in orange. Let's see, these are what we observe as labeled positives and everything in gray is unlabeled. Then what we want to do is we wanna find a classifier that will separate positives from negatives. So what we wanna do is find this blue decision boundary. But because of the fact that these positives are unlabeled, if we were to take an approach, like let's say we'll just pretend that the unlabeled data is all negative, this is a very common uh, strategy. The problem is that if we actually find the classifier that minimizes this objective, we would find something like this red boundary where we're gonna perfectly separate our labeled data from our unlabeled data, not our positives from our negatives. And so in um, Duplessis et al. in 2016 and then this Kiro et al. paper in 2017, which is a follow-up to that, um, these are sort of, this, this was a study on, is there a general approach we can use in which we basically reformulate this objective to actually estimate the true error in separating positives from negatives, even though we only have unlabeled data. And so you, you actually can, you can rewrite the true objective in this way. 
Um, and But the problem is that if you minimize this, you still find the same decision boundary, this red bun. And so then they propose this follow-up where you can bound this part of it. And, and the idea is that it should then find only this blue boundary, um, though it's, it's still somewhat limited. It is better than the naive method. However, we can think about approaching positive unlabeled learning from a slightly different perspective, where rather than trying to estimate the uh, true positive negative empirical loss, what we might want to say is we can make the observation that if we know the fraction of positives, then what we want is a classifier that gets our labeled data correct, cl correctly classifies our labeled data, and then use the fraction of positives to actually impose a constraint on our unlabeled data. So what that means is we can say if we have a classifier that's a probabilistic classifier here, this, this g of x, then we want the expectation of this classifier over our unlabeled data to be equal to the positive class prior. And we can impose this constraint softly, which we have to do in the context of, a, of neural networks because we need to train them with stochastic gradient descent um, using this kind of generalized expectation criteria idea. And so one way we could do this is to say, we're going to minimize our loss on our labeled data plus this KL divergence term, which basically just penalizes how different the expectation of our classifier over the unlabeled data is from our positive class prior. And this can work very well, but we still have a problem, which is that because we need to train our classifier with mini batch stochastic gradient descent, we have to estimate this objective from subsamples of our data. And in particular, this KL term ends up actually being biased as a result. So this expectation here should be calculated over all the data, but if we estimate this expectation with a sample of the data, um, we, we end up in a place where this is actually only minimized when g of x is equal to pi or all x. And that's not ideal because then we haven't really separated our positives from our negatives. But we can make an observation that the number of positive data points, E, in a mini batch, so in a subsample of our data of in data containing in data points, follows a binomial distribution with probability of success given by the positive class prior. This is just the probability that we sample a positive from our unlabeled data. And then the distribution over the number of positives we would have in in samples. And then our classifier predictions um, also define a distribution over the number of positives, which we can approximate with a normal distribution with these parameters. And then we can define a new um, objective function, a new GE criteria, where we use these distributions and what we do is we minimize the cross entropy between. The idea is that we want to fit our classifiers distribution um, to be sort of under this prior. And um, and so what we can do is we can ask, okay, if we train classifiers with these objective functions, um, do how well do they perform? So just to look at this quickly on a cryo-EM data set, so these are general purpose methods for positive and labeled learning. They can be used for other problems, but since we're interested in particle picking, we'll benchmark them on, on some particle picking problems. So what we're going to do is look at two data sets. First is MPR-196. And the second is a data set provided by the Shapiro lab of this elongated particle I just showed you before. And what we have are micrographs with particles labeled. So for MPR 196, the, part, the labeled particles are the published particle set. And for the Shapiro lab data, this is these are particles that were hand labeled by Julia Brash, who's a postdoc there. And we're gonna split the data sets into train and test sets. Um, at the micrograph level. So for MPR 196, 100 micrographs are held out for testing. For Shapiro Lab, 20 micrographs are held out for testing. And we're going to use these to evaluate the performance of the models trained on the training set. Ah. So what we can look at is what happens if we train a classifier using these each of these different methods with a different number of labeled positives on these two data sets and then measure its performance on the test set. So we can train a classifier with only 10 labeled positives 
100 labeled positives or 1,000 labeled positives. And if we repeat that 10 times, what I'm plotting here with randomly sampled subsets of the training set particles, what I'm plotting here are the performance the uh, mean and standard deviation of, of this average precision score on the test set. And so what we can see is that actually, if we take the naive approach, we perform um, much uh, more poorly than if we use any of the positive unlabeled learning methods, but that these constraint-based methods are much better than the non-negative risk estimator. And this is true on both data sets. The Shapiro lab data set is much more difficult. You can see that actually all methods fail at 10 data points, but as we go up to 1,000 data points, we start to have success. And in this intermediate range, the constraint-based positive and label learning methods are much better than these other two methods. So um, what I hope the takeaway from that is, is that PU learning allows us to train high accuracy classifiers, but without exhaustively labeled data. Um, what I'll show you is Topaz is the first implementation of this idea for particle picking in cryo-EM. PU learning in Topaz outperforms state of the art non-negative risk estimator. This is a general purpose uh, positive unlabeled learning method. And it dramatically outperforms the naive approach. And just, just to clarify about the naive approach, every other convolutional neural net particle picker, to the best of my knowledge, um, either explicitly requires negative labels or makes that assumption. In other words, it makes the assumption that all data that is not labeled positively is negative. So this should just illustrate why PU learning should get us much better results. And we can add one extra idea, which is to form this hybrid classifier autoencoder model. And in the hybrid model, the idea is basically that we want to um, regularize sort of the representations learned by our classifier by making them also be generative. So the idea is that given a micrograph window, we encode it into our latent representation, which we would use to classify, but we also need it to decode back into our micrograph window. And this idea is, has been used also in, in general in the machine learning community for semi-supervised learning. And so we can ask basically, if we include this reconstruction error term um, with some weight, can we actually do even better when we have very few labeled data points? The answer is yes especially here on this NPR 196 data set, if we include an autoencoder with weight greater than zero, so he, zero here, this is no autoencoder. Um, this gamma equals one is an autoencoder always with weight one, and here we have an autoencoder where we're going to lower the weight of the reconstruction error term when we have more data. So we can see that actually including the autoencoder can dramatically improve results when we have very few labeled data points. It's a little bit less effective here. This data set is much more difficult. But here on this data set, if we include this autoencoder, we, we actually like have a substantial improvement in performance. So here, we can actually completely solve this data set with only 10 labeled particles. So if a person labeled 10 particles and used the autoencoder, they can basically get perfect picking results. Okay, so putting this all together, we've talked about how you can train a classifier. So how do we actually build this into a particle picker. So Topaz, basically the, the framework is that we are going to train a classifier with positive and unlabeled micrograph regions. So given a small number of labeled particles, that defines our positive and unlabeled regions. We're then gonna train a classifier with the GE binomial objective function. And once we have the classifier, we can then um, score micrograph regions so we score every region with the classifier, and then we extract particle coordinates using this non-maximum suppression algorithm. And the source code is available here. Um, there's also installation instructions, user tutorials. Uh, it's free software licensed under GPL v3. And just to quickly highlight the difference between the pipeline that I just proposed for Topaz and sort of the conventional way of doing particle picking is that in the topaz, the idea is we're going to label a small representative set of particles, use that to train a classifier, and then use the classifier to extract predicted particle coordinates, and that's our particle set. We're done. Versus conventionally, what we would do is, or what people typically do, is to sort of apply template-based or difference of Gaussian's filter, 
do 2D or 3D class averaging, throw away classes that look like junk by eye because these things have very high false positive rates. Then you could do a 3D reconstruction to discard additional four subsets of particles. And then iterate on this process some number of times before you end up with some final filtered particle set. And so um, this involves a lot of, this is sort of ad hoc. You have to look, you have to determine whether these are, by, are, are good or bad by eye. And you have to repeat this some number of times. So it can be, can be very time consuming. And for things that don't fit well into particles that aren't uh, picked well by these kinds of uh, approaches, it, it can completely fail. In addition, it actually can introduce a lot of bias. So, so in Topaz, really the only source of bias comes here at this first step, where if a user doesn't label a representative set, then you can have some bias. But this is pretty well understood. It's clear where the bias would come from. But in the conventional uh, framework, actually you can have bias introduced at every step and it's not really clear what, what the bias will do. So these methods have bias. This has bias because you may be throwing away classes that are, have uh, views that are lowly represented or represent some other confirmation of your protein or something. And same here. And then, you know, if we repeat this a number of times, it's not clear that at the end you haven't thrown away a lot of real particles. So just to, okay. So now to illustrate the uh, power of, of Topaz, what we're going to look at is go back to this this Shapiro lab data set, and here this this data set was collected by Julia. So thanks to her for letting us use this data set. Actually, it's uh, she has a paper coming out soon in, in Nature presenting this. So the this data set has extremely low signal to noise. This unusually shaped particle. Uh, we have 1,500 labeled particles provided by Julia. So I'm going to split this into train and test micrographs, and then we're going to pick it using Topaz. And so here's just another illustration of one of her micrographs. Lots of noise, very low signal to noise ratio on the particle. And here are some of the particles that she labeled. And so if we pick this with Topaz, it actually recovers 30,000 particles. So here's what Topaz picks on this micrograph highlighted in red here. Um, no other method succeeds on this data, to my knowledge. Um, you know, and, and the labels are very sparse. So if you were to train, a, a use a picker that assumes that all of this is negative, then it won't work. And exhaustively labeling micrographs is nearly impossible because it's so hard to see where the particles are. It would take a very long time to comb through this micrograph by eye and actually label all of the particles. So, so uh, which is sort of the scenario Topaz is designed for, the scenario where we don't don't assume that all of the particles have been labeled. Okay, here's just another quick example of two more micrographs from this data set. So you can see Topaz also completely avoids grid, doesn't pick this background stuff, even though we don't have explicit, uh, explicit negatives. Okay, so that's great, but we can't unfortunately do a reconstruction with that data set just because of the nature of the particle. So the question is then, okay, um, can we look at some more data sets? Like, are these particles actually good? And we'll assess that by doing some reconstructions on three more data sets. So Topaz does enable high resolution reconstruction with minimal labeling and no post-processing. So on the three data sets we're going to look at are the T20S proteasome, the ADS ribosome, and this rabbit muscle aldolase data set. And um, so the framework here is going to be that each of these data sets has micrographs and particle coordinates associated with the published structure for the data set. So because these are publicly available, they were studied before and the and and in those studies, you know, there's some set of particles associated with the 3D structure that was curated however was done in that study, right? So that represents sort of the conventional approach. So for the T20S proteasome, we have almost 200 micrographs, about 50,000 particles. The ADS ribosome has 1,000 micrographs with about 100,000 particles. And for aldolase, we have about 800 micrographs with about 200,000 particles. And so to compare, uh, oh, just to show you quickly what these data sets look like. So here's the uh, 20S proteasome. And here in blue, this is, this is the highlights of the particles that are included in the published particle set. 
here's the ribosome, here's aldolase. So this, this data set is extremely densely packed. And you can see that these aren't um, conventionally difficult data sets, but they do still represent an interesting test case to see really how well can we do with this framework. So what, what we do is we hold out to, to benchmark two is we're gonna hold out 20% of the micrographs for evaluation. So we take all micrographs, hold out 20% with whatever published particles there are on those micrographs. Then given the micrographs left over for our training set, we're going to simulate labeling a thousand particles by sampling from the published particle set, right? So, so we're gonna simulate labeling a thousand particles. And what that looks like is this. So here are those two micrographs from 20S proteasome. And what I've highlighted here now are what's, what are considered labeled particles. So from this random sample of a thousand particles over all the micrographs. So here are the particles on these two. You can see we have only two here, five here. It's extremely sparse labeling. Ribosome, here are, here are our examples as well. And for aldolase also. So the labeling is very, very sparse that we're gonna to use to train Topaz. So now we have these 1,000 labeled particles on our training micrographs. We'll fit the classifier. And then we're going to extract predicted particle coordinates using the train classifier. And so what that looks like is this. So here in red are the particles that Topaz detects. So you can see that Topaz actually does a very good job, at least sort of qualitatively here, in detecting where the particles are despite being trained with so few, it recovers virtually all of the published particles and many more. Same with the ribosome, same with aldolase. This is extremely tightly packed. So basically it's particles right next to each other. And so we can see as Topaz picks many more real particles, even though we use very few training particles. So Topaz, here, here are the exact numbers. It picks, you know, almost four times as many particles on the T20S proteasome and aldolase and about 80% more for the ADS ribosome. And, and so then, okay, so we have these particle sets, but are they really good? So, so to evaluate really whether actually these particles are good, what we're going to do is do take, take the particle set and do ab initio structure determination in CryoSpark and then structure refinement in CryoSpark with no filtering of the particles. So those particles I just showed you are just handed to you by Topaz, right? We're not doing any post-processing. There's no 2D classification for filtering, no 3D classification for filtering, nothing. We're gonna go straight to a refinement. So for the T20S proteasome, if we do this, we actually get a, a structure, a 2.8 angstrom structure compared to doing this with the published data set, we get a three angstrom structure. And to ask whether really these particles that we've added are good, what we also do is we take the topaz particles and we remove all the published particles and then look at that structure. And we still reach a 2.96 angstrom structure. And um, qualitatively, they're essentially the same structure in terms of the features that we can see in, in, in the protein. And but the highlight really is that Topaz finds many more particles, many more particles, and with no post-processing, we can just get the structure immediately. For the ribosome, we see roughly the same thing. Um, Topaz, we get a three angstrom structure here and more particles. So in the Topaz minus published, we also find roughly the same structure. Um, and then for aldolase, we, we find also the same structure. So here, aldolase, the, the original data set already had a lot of particles. So it's maybe not surprising that, that we actually don't really see any improvement. But, but again, the point is that Topaz finds a lot more particles and they're all good enough that we can just determine the structure immediately without any additional particle. Now, that isn't to say that you can't do additional particle filtering, but it isn't necessary. Okay, so the last thing that's great about this approach to particle picking is that because we have a classifier, the classifier assigns a score to every region. And so what that means is that we have a score associated with every predicted particle. So 
This score corresponds roughly to, corresponds to the predicted log likelihood ratio that a coordinate is a particle. So what that means is it's saying the log probability that this is a particle minus the log probability that this is not a particle. So what that means is that this score should rank our particles well according to the likelihood that it is a particle, rank, rank our coordinates. So we, when something we can do is we can trade off the number of true and false positives by changing the score threshold at which particles are selected. And so to illustrate this on these three data sets, what, what we can do is we can ask, okay, as we change the score threshold, so as we lower the score threshold, what we get more and more and more and more particles given by topaz. And then we can take those particle sets and do a reconstruction and see how, how does our resolution change, right? So, so for the proteasome, Right, as we increase the number of particles by lowering the threshold in Topaz, we get more and more and more particles, and the resolution of our structure improves, 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 improves until some point here where it starts to dip down, which is maybe because we've started to introduce too many false positives. We've lowered the threshold too much. And we can see roughly the same trend with the other two data sets, except that we don't actually end up hitting that dip point here, maybe. It's hard, hard to say exactly. Um, and if we quantify this with 2D classification, then we can also look at as we lower the threshold, we get more particles. And then we can look at these classes to try and quantify which are true positives and which are false positives. And so um, as we lower the threshold, we get more and more particles and, and slightly higher fraction of them becomes false positive. But the false positive rate actually stays remarkably low, especially for like, the, let's say this Aldolase data set here. Um, probably because in Aldolase almost everything is a particle. Um, but the, the threshold, uh, the number of false positives is remarkably low. And so to see what these classes look like, um, we can look at them. So here's 2D classes for the, for the proteasome. And here in orange, I've just boxed classes that we consider to be false positives. And actually, these are probably very conservative false positives. So one reason being that this data set has, has some gold particle contamination. And so some of these classes actually are, are the protein next to a gold particle. So for example, here, we're looking down the barrel of the proteasome, and this is a little gold speck next to it. And it gets classified. So, so all the particles with these sort of gold specks end up being put into this class. So it is really a protein. It just has a gold speck there. And then, but, but what we can see is that as we lower the threshold and increase the number of particles, we start to slowly introduce these, these classes containing lower quality particles, maybe particles that aren't well centered, some, whatever this is, um, and these gold flake, gold spec contamination particles. So, so what this shows is that actually the topaz score does well, does rank our particles in a reasonable way. Here's the ribosome. Um, maybe these are broken ribosomes. And then here's aldolase. Aldolase really, the number of false positives is very low. So, um, okay. So in summary, what I, I hope we've illustrated here is that Topaz uh, PU learning with our GE binomial loss function outperforms other training methods for convolutional neural networks. We can form a hybrid of this classifier and autoencoder, which can further improve our performance when few labeled data points are available. We put this idea together into a software package called Topaz, which is our object detection pipeline for particle picking. And Topaz allows us to pick challenging particles and avoid junk, despite having very few using very few labeled data points. And Topaz also enables high resolution reconstruction without ad hoc post-process. Um, and for more information, you can feel free to look at the manuscript. It's under review, but you can find the preprint on archive. So, Acknowledgements. I need to thank uh, my advisor, Bonnie, and uh, collaborators, Alex and Julia, who um, Julia labeled that helped out with uh, providing the data set. And Alex has done a lot of work in general on helping with the uh, validation and some future future additions to Topaz. Then also uh, Andrew and, and Larry Shapiro. Okay. So, Topaz, um, 
coming soon, we will have uh, we, we have an improved workflow and a simple GUI that we're going to be releasing with the next version of Topaz. Actually, hope, hopefully that will be released later this week. Here's just a screen cap of what the GUI looks like. It's, it's a simple web-based GUI just to assist with labeling. We also are planning Appian, Emantu, and Scipion integration. Um, that's a little bit further out, but hopefully also will be done in the near future. And um, go to GitHub, look, you can, installation instructions, particle picking tutorials are all there. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, got a, a bunch of questions here. Um, if you have okay. questions, you can send them by chat and I can pass them on. I can also unmute uh, mics if you wanna ask your question yourself, just send me a message and I'll unmute. So one question that I had, another uh, listener also has that, that initial set of particles is really small and uh, small enough that it makes yep. you wonder if it covers all possible orientations of the particle you're picking and how sensitive are you to the fact that um, you might have a biased set of orientations? Yeah, that's why, okay, let me go back. Uh, emphasis here is on uh, representative set, right? You know, so we can understand well how we could get biased, but I, yes, that that is sort of an issue that that is, hard for me to address in general because it depends on your particle, right? So for for example, for the T20S proteasome, right, um, we really only have two views. So in a sense, you could imagine that maybe you only need two particles to have a representative set. You need a top view and a side view, right? Um, but but yeah, in, in practice, that's probably not enough. So so there's a couple of things that can still help, right? So so one is that um, as long as your other views are similar enough, then the classifier can still find them, right? It can still generalize to those views. So for example, in the ribosome, right? All of the view, these aren't all the same view, but in general, the ribosome is kind of blurry enough that the classifier generalizes. Even if we don't actually have an example from every specific view. Um, on the other hand, th there are actually a thousand examples here. It's just on these micrographs, you know, there's only one on this micrograph, but but there are a thousand examples total. So of course, if we go to, if we go to um, the 196 data set here, right? This data set, yeah, we succeed with only 10 particles, um, but it's because there's not a lot of diversity. It, it, for for this data set, which is much harder and has a lot more diversity, you know, we fail with 10 particles. So as a good rule of thumb, like you can actually, you can figure out whether you're succeeding or failing if you have a, a test set that you can measure the performance on also. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, you know, so the other thing is if, you, if you're worried, you can always label more particles, but um, so it sort of depends on the data set. If your data set it has, is very homogenous in terms of general view, it's easy for the classifier to generalize, then you can get away with really few, really few labels. But if it's a lot more complicated, like the Shapiro lab data set, then you need more labels. So it does have some capacity to sort of bootstrap orientations. Oh yeah, definitely, absolutely, yeah. Right, it, 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 cool. it's, it's hard for me to, um, I can't give you an answer for every data set, but for a, most data sets or for a lot of data sets like ribosome, your views just don't actually look that different. So the classifier still generalizes. So uh, another question, um, micrographs have uh, pixel sizes in the 1.5 angstrom to 0 0.6 angstrom. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to the sensitivity of the network architecture to the magnification of the microscope as in, yeah. um, initial filter sizes need to downsample images. Yeah, so something I didn't mention is that actually in the Topaz pipeline, we always downsample the micrographs first. Um, basically, uh, I, I recommend downsampling to roughly eight angstroms per pixel. So you, because, because of that reason, if you, if you fed in raw micrographs, the receptive field of your classifier would have to be very large. So you would have to do a lot of downsampling early in the in the model, but but uh, it's actually easier if we just do downsampling of the micrographs themselves because 
we can use like truncating the Fourier transform to actually have a to do um, better downsampling anyway. And then and also we apply a normalization step. So so uh, that that's my recommendation. So so actually in Topaz the software itself. We have a couple of different options for architectures of the convolutional neural network that have slightly different receptive field sizes. But the main idea is really just to make sure that your particle, like you downsample your micrographs enough that the size of your particle fits within the receptive field of the model. So if you're using a model with like a 70 pixel receptive field, you just need to make sure the diameter of your particle is less than 70 pixels in your downsampled micrographs. One question here. and. Uh, I was thinking about this a little bit too. If your if your sort of log likelihood gain score, this uh, the score that you this is per pixel, right? This isn't per. It is right. So, does that give you any indication on um, what parts or features of particles are important for getting picked, and um, maybe how the the net is picking up on it, and what might conceivably fool it? Um, okay. So it is per pixel, which is actually great. So for example, like here's an illustration of that. Yeah, it's great. You can visualize that. Um, but this is just the output of the model. So, so in the sense that it doesn't really tell you which features are important because the way the labeling works is basically we say, okay, you, here's some coordinate here, right? So that means that there's, you know, some small number of pixels here that we're going to consider positive regions. And so the classifier is being trained to classify all of those as positive regions. So if you look here, right, you see these sort of hot spots around the center of a particle. And that's what we want because it, it lets you better localize the center of particles. So you get better centered particle coordinates when we use non-maximum suppression. But it it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a nice interpretability in the sense of like which features are important. You could look at the actual feature maps of the convolutional neural net. You could, you could plot those. That's straightforward to do if you have the model. Um, if you want to just sort of try and have some sort of interpretation. I, I personally, I'm, I'm not sure that's very meaningful because it's going to be different for different data sets. And so, you know, maybe we can look at the filters for this data set, but I, I don't know what that really tells you. Yeah. So I have one more and uh, wrap it up because we've got a few. Um, sure. One is that, uh, see, it's in the chat, so maybe we can figure this out. Is, is pi p the ratio of negative particles or the fraction of positive pixels in a particle frame? Um, the fraction of positive. Okay. So if you have a micrograph like this, some fraction of regions are positive regions. It's that fraction. Actually, in in the in the software now as well, uh, we have a we have a little bit more intuitive way of choosing pi. So because pi that that's a fraction, but it, it it's related to the expected number of particles per micrograph, right? Because like, let's say I expect there to be 100 particles per micrograph. And I've defined, I know how many positive pixels in, my, in a micrograph there are per particle. So that lets you set pi, but by thinking instead about how many, how many particles do I expect there to be. All right, with that, uh, I think we'll wrap it up. The new version looks exciting. It's cool that there's a GUI coming. Uh, Cypion and Cryo Spark integration coming. Do you know what the timeline around that is, or is it? Uh, um, depend on the I would say the, uh, my hope is that the Appion Eman2 and Cypion integration will happen in the next month ish. The th this release is coming a lot sooner though. Like, like I was saying, I next end of the week. Fingers crossed. Oh, cool. <laughs> So uh, that's fantastic, and we will add it. Right now, the uh, Topaz is in the SP Grid tree. Uh, it's relatively new, so you may not have it at your site. Shoot me an email if you want to give it a try. Right now, it's um, primarily the tutorial uses a Jupyter Notebook, which is also included, so it's pretty straightforward. So um, shoot me an email, and I can make sure you've got it. And uh, Tristan, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Take care.